So uh, good morning, Michael. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us and a very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us online um, today for the launch of our Broken Plate report. I'm so thrilled to be chatting to you about this report, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, um, because we've obviously got a sort of inequality, health inequalities narrative that runs right through this report. So I'm really keen to talk to you um, and and see what you think about the issues which are raised within it. I'm really keen to hear your 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 insights. And of course, I think it's important to note for everybody listening that you're also um, a trustee of the Food Foundation. We're incredibly lucky to have you on our board. So I'm um, really, really looking for, forward to the conversation and thank you for joining. My pleasure. Um, we've, we've, we've been trying to make this report kind of get a little bit more famous every year. And this year it's, um, it's starting to really feel like it's a bit of a landmark moment when it, when it comes out, we've had some great coverage on some, you know, big kind of media moments with uh, country file and woman's hour in the last few weeks, which is all quite exciting. And there's a lot of ongoing media interest. So we're pleased about that. Um, and there's some new elements to the report this year that you'll no doubt have noticed. I'm just going to summarise them briefly for those that are listening, I'm sure some of whom have read previous editions of the report. So this year we've got a new metric, which is around the marketing of baby and toddler snacks. Um, be good to pick up on that because I know you've done a huge amount of work in your work on early years. Um, the cost of sustainable uh, alternatives to um, animal source food. So last year we focused on milk and non-dairy milk alternatives. <laughs> this year we've looked at alternatives to chicken. Um, and uh, we've got a series of new metrics around um, the outcomes that we're concerned about, dental caries, consumption of ultra processed foods, healthy life expectancy, um, some quite very concerning data in there, which I'm sure you're going to have um, lots to comment on on that. So I wanted to just start by hearing your thoughts about the report in general and then really would like to start to sort of dig into the sort of social determinants sort of interpretation around this report and, and chat through that with you. Well let me start with something that might sound tangential. Uh, UN AIDS has just launched a global council on inequality AIDS and pandemics, and I'm a co-chair of this council. And when we announced it in Brazil two weeks ago, I said that the two big problems that face us are the climate emergency and inequalities. And I might have been talking about broken plate. I wasn't, but I might have been, because you've situated broken plate precisely in the context of those two global emergencies of growing inequalities and the climate emergency. Um, so I'm delighted with it. Can I pick up one that you didn't mention, but it's on my mind at the moment for reasons that you'll know, which is children's height. Oh, yeah. And you've got the graph in there. And I've been looking at those very same figures. Um, and you point out that children age five in the UK are shorter than virtually every other rich country. In fact, on a global scale, children age five, we were ranked in 1985, 69th among all countries um, for boys, and that's now slipped to 102. And for girls, we were ranked 69th in 1985 among global countries. Now we're 96. So for a long time, we've been doing very badly on children's height. And if you think about why is nutrition important and why are inequalities in nutrition important, children's height kind of sums it up, doesn't it? Because yeah it predicts what happens for the rest of life. We know people who are shorter have higher mortality from heart disease. People who are shorter uh, do less well socially and economically. Now that may not be because their height determined their success, but the same social conditions that lead to good nutrition and indeed 
less stress, which is also important for height. Those same conditions which determine children's height are also predictors of social and economic performance later in life. So children's height is telling us something very important. We've slipped back on the rankings. There are big inequalities and not shown in broken plate, but in the figures that I've looked at, the mean height for children age five in the second half from 2000 and 12, 14 to 2019 has not only stopped increasing, it's actually gone down a bit. And that shouldn't happen. Our genes yeah. didn't change. Um, it means the quality of nutrition, uh, the quality in which children are born and growing has got worse. And nutrition clearly plays an important part in that. So I look at the rest of the report in that context. My gosh, We've got an urgent, very bad outcome, children's height. Now, why is that happening? And the rest of the, the Broken Plate Report really addresses those issues. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think the height measure is so interesting because at age five, it does really capture that breadth of environmental factors which are shaping how children are growing up um obviously diet is a really really important one of those but so is exposure to infection stress all those other things which might contribute to children not growing properly and you're right there's this differential amongst the high income western countries where the uk is really ranked very near well the bottom for boys and i think second bottom for girls or it might have been vice versa, we've got a, a seven centimetres difference between that and the highest children at age five, the tallest children at age five in the Netherlands. So, I mean, really, really big differences. And as you say, also this difference between uh, children in the most disadvantaged country uh, uh, parts of the country compared to the least, the, uh, the least deprived areas. And again, significant differences, um, differences there. So, you're right, but I hadn't picked up that dropping in the ranking that you've described um, over the period that you talked about. And that's also incredibly um, concerning. And I think it's interesting that this has kind of captured the media's attention in the last few weeks around that as a marker, because we've been so focused on childhood obesity almost that we've sort of forgotten about all of those other aspects about what we eat and how vital they are for our bodies and our brains, you know, what those nutrients that we're consuming and that these hugely protective effects of good food, which too many people are missing out on and, you know, life enhancing aspects of eating well. And we've been very, very focused, I mean, with good reason, but very focused on body weight and obesity. And we've perhaps missed quite an important trend in the data here in thinking about height. Um, and it's not fanciful. Uh, don't ask me to cite the evidence off the top of my head, but it's not fanciful to speculate that the same set of factors that influence children's height also influence cognitive development. So... Um um, it, it, it say that it's not fanciful. And there's evidence that I've been looking at very recently um, on adverse childhood experiences and height. Um, so it's nutrition, of course, but as you said, Anna, it's other things. Uh, you mentioned infection, but uh, adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. will have an impact on height and they'll have an impact on mental health on cognitive and social development so height is important in and of itself but it's important as an indicator of a whole set of inequalities that are shaping people's lives and part of that is inequalities in nutrition yeah absolutely um OK, let's move on and just um, span out a little bit more broadly, because I, I wanted to discuss with you, you've obviously been the person that globally that has shaped the narrative around the social determinants of health. And I think in when we're thinking about food, um, the way that we 
to, I suppose, talk about some of these issues is that we've got what perhaps might be more classically sort of social determinants of poor diet in the sense that we've got too many people who don't, don't have enough money to afford to be able to eat well. Um, and we see that in our metric. In fact, the metric which you've often cited yeah. of our data has worsened this year. So it's now for the poorest quintile, you would need to spend 50% of your disposable income on food in order to be able to afford the Eat Well Guide. And that's jumped up from 43 last year. So that's a significant deterioration in the situation. So there's a kind of money problem, which is a more kind of classic, I suppose, social determinant in the way that we think about the social determinants of health. But then we also have a food system which makes it even harder for you if you've got a low income because it dominates with cheap, unhealthy food, essentially. And I suppose what we might call in that bucket the sort of com a set of commercial determinants which are the way that the market has been shaped and the incentives that are built in within that within that system. And then when we come when it comes to food, we also have a very distinctive, distinct narrative. And but maybe this does is reflected in other areas of the social determinants. We have this onus on personal responsibility, this sort of idea that um actually it's nothing to do with the environments around us we've all got agency personal choice it's up to you what you eat if you end up with an unhealthy weight it's your fault it's the sort of broad you know frame that's very dominant in the media so and I was thinking you know would people say that about housing for example would people say well it's personal responsibility if you live in poor housing like sort it out kind of thing. Um, I don't think they would in the same way. I think that food is something which is seen as sort of very distinctive in the sort of private domain, um, I suppose. And I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on those sort of three, social, commercial, personal responsibility. How, whether you see there's anything really distinctive about diet and food, which makes it a little bit different from the other social determinants of health that you 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 think about when you're when you're doing your work well it's a very important debate and i was at a meeting pre covid i think one of the last meetings i went to pre covid checking into the meeting place and a, an american said i don't want the government telling me what to eat it's a matter of my choice. And I said, when you checked into the hotel, did you ask for a room without asbestos? And she looked at me. I said, and then the penny dropped. I said, you kind of expected that uh, when you checked in, you wouldn't have to ask for a room without asbestos. There would be no asbestos um, in your hotel room. And do, did that aspect of the nanny state bother you? And she said, well, no. I said, okay, so we're agreed that there is social responsibility for certain aspects. When you turned on the tap, did you ask if the water had been microbiologically tested? Well, of course not you expect, I mean, if you're in a low income country, you might not drink the water from the tap for very good reasons. But in a high income country, and increasingly in a middle income country, you expect to be able to drink the water from the tap. So now we're having a debate, given that we've agreed that there is social responsibility for some of the determinants of good health. Now that we're so now we can have a debate as to where the line should be. Uh, it's not to say that individual responsibility is unimportant, um, but if you're living in substandard housing, you didn't make the choice. That might well be what you can afford. And I, the reason I've cited the Food Foundation data, uh, as you know, I cited it when you first produced the data by decile uh, of household consumption. And you said, for good reasons, uh, the calculations are a bit unstable in the bottom decile because students or whatever uh, included. But 
it seems to me that those food foundation data saying that you have to spend around 50% of your income to eat healthily. Uh, I've got data, if you're in the bottom 10% of households, you'd have to spend 18% on energy. So now that's 68% of your household consumption to eat healthily and on energy. What about paying the rent? What about uh, buying children a new pair of trainers because they'd outgrown the old ones? Mm -hmm. So when somebody says, well, it's up to individuals to choose to eat healthily, I show them the data yeah. and say, if people in the top quintile who only need to spend 11% of their income to eat healthily, if they choose to give their children um, crummy food, then they're being irresponsible because they're in a position to make choices. And if they choose to feed their children food that is damaging, then yeah, individual responsibility is really important. And those rich people have got no one to blame but themselves. Now I'm overstating it because another point of the Food Foundation's work is about the general food environment. Mm -hmm. It is actually more costly and more difficult to feed nutritious food, particularly in Britain, much more so in Britain than in other countries. Mm -hmm. If you're in Mediterranean countries, um, this social gradient in, for example, fruit and vegetable consumption is not seen. Mm -hmm. um, Poor people eat as much fruit and vegetables uh, as rich people in Mediterranean countries in general, but we see it in Britain. So there's a real distinction. It's an important debate. We all think that individual responsibility is important. Of course it is. But your ability to take those important decisions is constrained by your social and economic environment, by the price differential of nutritious food, the fact it's more expensive, by the fact that inflation has particularly affected food and energy more than other commodities, and by the fact that you haven't got enough money to mm. eat healthily. And a rhetoric about, oh, if I I could cook, I could live on 30p a day and poor people have only got themselves to blame. I think it's extremely unhelpful and doesn't fit with the evidence. Mm. I mean, I think on your point about the wider food environment, this point about how how much individual responsibility even people who have a high income have, I think is important to think because we've got the metrics in there on availability and appeal as well. So beyond price, obviously this huge amount of advertising spend that goes on junk food. But I think the really telling one here around agency is the baby and toddler snacks and all of these claims on those. So even if you've, you know, you're, you're desperate, you don't mind how much you spend and you're desperately seeking the best thing for your child. It's like a kind of maze of confusion if you're not incredibly well versed in being able to understand a label and disentangle all the kind of messages which are on a product, which are trying to point you in the direction of well, this kind of health halo. So even for somebody on a high income in that situation, I think the system is acting against their best interests. Well, speaking as a grandfather of two little grandchildren, I can tell you I'm learning all over again how difficult it, it, it is to um, ensure good nutrition, uh, how the easy route uh, is not always the healthiest route. And... Uh, it's a tussle. Um, mm. So, and it's exactly what you're saying. It's the food environment that makes it so much more difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to pick up on something which um, uh, Keir Starmer said recently, which you you will no doubt be fully versed in around in his speech around um, the health mission, which La the Labour Party have set out. He said he wanted not just to have Marmot 
areas of the country, but for England to be a marmot country, which was um, a wonderful statement, of course. Um, I'd like to hear what you think of of well, what you think of it overall. But I think I'm particularly interested in what that might look like for food from your perspective. Well, in my 2010 Marmot Review, in my 2020 uh, Marmot Review, 10 years on, and in the series of reports we've done for Marmot cities all around the country, we've had six domains of recommendations, and the, several of them are relevant to food. Give every child the best start in life. Well, you and I have just been talking about the importance of early nutrition, education and lifelong learning. School shouldn't be a place to have terrible quality food. I mean, the food and free school meals, uh, the Food Foundation has been very active uh, on that. Um, the third, employment and working conditions. Well, that relates to the others. We know that a majority, more than 50% of people who are in poverty are in households where at least one adult is working. So work is not the way out of poverty. And we've just been discussing the impact of poverty on nutrition. Number four, which links to number three, everyone should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. And uh, the um, Joseph Roundtree Foundation and the Trussell Trust, the food banks, um, calculated that universal credit provides about 70% of the cost of necessaries. And necessaries include food and shelter and clothing. Um, so that's key. The environment is number five. Well, you and I have just been talking about availability of healthy food and the impact on the environment of healthy food. And the sixth one is what I call taking a social determinants approach to prevention, which again is what you and I have been talking about. It's not saying don't be fat, um, eat healthily. It's understanding the constraints on people's behaviors, uh, how difficult it is not to be overweight or obese, to feed your children healthy food and the like. So, and we've been working with cities precisely because the national government hasn't been interested in my recommendations. In fact, they've been happily, or maybe unhappily, uh, pursuing the opposite to all six of those. And so we've been working with cities. So, yeah, I was delighted when Keir Starmer and West Reading came out and said, we want to reverse that. We want to make England a Marmot country. Some of my relatives have applied for exit visas. Um, <laughs> uh, but we'll put that aside. Um, <laughs> but... Um, it's saying this is not just about spending money, although you do need to spend money, but I think food and nutrition are integral pretty well to all six of those domains of recommendations. Mm, yeah. And do you think, are you confident that if they were to be elected at the next election, that it would move a pace in the right direction? Well, you know, I've been asked many times, you know, would you like Keir Starmer and the Labour to be bolder? And, I, you know, my response is, I'm not a politician. I'm not a political advisor. Uh, they want to win the election uh, and I can't advise them on the best way to win the election. I can, I'm very outspoken about what I'd like to see happen, whether saying those things is to work the way to win an election. I'm not the best person to judge, but I would really like them to come out and say, I mean, we are, our society is severely lacking. The fact that we can rank about a hundred on height in five-year-old children is an indicator of how poorly our society is doing. And that means we want radical change. 
Michael, that's a perfect way to end the conversation today. Thank you so much. I know your time is incredibly precious and it's been absolutely brilliant to have you on on today's webinar. Um, I did also want to say a very huge congratulations to Shona Gowdy and the team who led the writing of the report. Um, it's a really fantastic read and would really urge you all to take a, a deeper look at what's in inside. Um, and if you haven't signed up to our award-winning podcast, please do subscribe. Um, there's lots of content being pushed out every week in the podcast um, and it's a great listen. And thank you all very much for joining us today. And um, we look forward to being in touch again soon. Bye.